Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Caseware webinar. Today, we are looking at the uh, updates included in the Audit Advanced uh, HAT Working Papers template release version 24.0.01. Um, this is an intermediate level uh, webinar, and uh, the content is going to be delivered to you by our special guest, Andrew Jarvis, Managing Director at HAT Group. My name is Tom Jeffrey. I'm one of the education and media technicians at Caseware UK, and I'll be making sure that everything's running smoothly during the session, uh, keeping an eye on questions and that sort of thing. And uh, talking of questions, if we just jump to the next slide, we can see that you've got the Zoom control panel there, um, slightly different on uh, desktop to mobile, but you've got the Q&A option. So if you have any questions, pop them in there and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. I'll, I'll look to put those to Andrew a bit later on. If we don't get back to you during the session, we'll do so afterwards. And we'll also include a Q&A document, which will be uh, attached to the recording. So we are recording the session and that will go on the help site, which will signpost a bit later on. Uh, the, the recording will also be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, that's our client services YouTube channel. And again, we'll signpost that a bit later. So that's the uh, housekeeping out of the way. I will pass you over to Andrew and we'll get started, first of all, with the agenda. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Um, yes, welcome to today's session. Hope it's uh, not too cold and snowy uh, where you are. Um, in terms of agenda today, obviously we want to take you through uh, the changes in 24.0.01. And as I'm sure you're aware, uh, the, the real fundamental drive, the, the, the reason for the content and the functionality changes uh, that you'll see in the template are the revised new ISAs, um, ISA 315, and ISA T40, which um, broadly speaking um, affect December 22 year ends. That's not quite technically a correct answer, but probably close enough for what we'll be covering this afternoon. Um, so ISA 315 and ISA T40, they really have a, quite a significant impact on our planning um, documentation. So we're, we're going to run through both an overview and then dip into a couple of those forms in a bit more detail to, to explain what has changed and, and why those changes have been made. Um, the other quite significant change, and I think this is for, for users of hack content, uh, this is quite a conceptual change, is the permanent section. Uh, we've always over the years shied away from putting too much pro forma, too much sort of set content in the permanent section, really leaving up to firms to uh, devise their own documentation, maybe client specific um, documentation in terms of systems notes, um, et cetera. Um, 315 does really, um, well, one of the purposes of 315, one of the objectives is to improve consistency across firms. And therefore we've felt the need to put in a little bit more guidance in the permanent section that we will look at. So we'll, we'll, we'll spend a, a little bit of time this afternoon looking at this first um, couple of points. Um, the, the next few points, I'm not actually going to go into any detail um, apart from just literally on this agenda slide. <clears throat> um, one of the key changes um, uh, really driven by 240, which as I'm sure you're aware, deals with fraud, is we have, we worked the end section of the fieldwork. Uh, that's other audit areas. Uh, and we split the audit program into two so so the old n2 program just disappears that's taken out on the update and two new programs come in n2-1 really dealing with everything or pretty much everything that should feed into the irregularity wording in the audit report so, so that free form wording in the audit report and possibly the, the biggest change there that you'll see is our work on journals uh which is incredibly important and has a lot of emphasis under both 315 and 240 moves from the U section to the N section. And the logic for that is journal testing. The U section covers nominal ledger, but the journal testing is actually nothing to do with the nominal ledger. It, well, of course, you're testing the nominal ledger, but the purpose of journal testing is looking for fraud, looking for inappropriate entries. So if it's better um, with uh, the, the rest of the work on irregularity and fraud on N2-1. Um, another change in the template, which I won't go into any details at all, is we have for the first time really given formal consideration uh, within the methodology of what ISO 315 calls automated tools and techniques. Now, um, that term is relatively wide. It covers all kinds of um, automated ways of doing audit. But in terms of the firms watching this, uh, you're probably going to be thinking about data analytics 
as being an automated tool and technique. And I know many firms have, have doubled with data analytics to greater or lesser success over the past um, couple of years. And the audit methodology now, now recognizes data analytics. And certainly in terms of the sampling, which we'll see a little bit later, uh, if you are using analytics successfully, uh, it allows you to reduce substantive sample size in the same way that you would do if you were performing good quality supportive analytical procedure. So we'll we'll look over the next few minutes at change to the planning permit section, but as I say, the end section and automated tools and techniques, uh, that's just really to, to signpost at this point uh, that there are changes there. Um, we'll then look in a bit more detail at the risk documentation. Do you want to bring up on screen our new assertion um, risk assessment and also how that affects the financial statement areas worksheet, which is clearly one of the sort of most, most fundamental um, elements of a case for a file and also look at the risks function and how that has changed as well. And then if time allows, just towards the end, I will um, uh, just pick up one or two other enhancements, uh, primarily counting estimates and two years um, down the line from 540 revised coming in, just how we tweak the documentation uh, to hopefully make it a little bit more user friendly. Um, so that's the agenda for today. Um, as you know, it's those two ICs that, that really govern the changes to the, the file. Um, 315 and 240. Uh, clearly, I haven't got time today to, to go through the, the, the reasons for the change. or well, in fact, the changes in detail. Uh, I know many people on watching this will already have taken separate training from HATS um, covering uh, those changes. Uh, and if you are after a good understanding of why these changes have happened and what they really mean from a client service point of view, from, from actually managing these effectively, then obviously had to have other training courses that are available. But in terms of these standards, um, 315 um, from the templates perspective is the big one. That is the one that has resulted in real changes to um, our planning stage, real changes to our risk documentation. 240 in reality is a bit of a non-issue. Yes, we've, we've popped in um, a new risk form. Yes, we've tweaked one or two questions in other places, but in terms of understanding how the template works, it's 315, which is the fundamental. Um, our planning stage, our planning section has been re-referenced. Um, if you think about planning, there's really four elements to planning. Um, appointments, gathering information from the client, the risk assessment feeding into the sort of formal audit approach, and then dissemination of, of information. Uh, and it's a third section there, the sort of risk assessment and audit approach, which is one that, that's seen fundamental changes within the case for a template. Um, when you apply update, when your team apply update, it should be, be pretty easy to spot whether the file has been updated or not, because this section, this middle section from 11 through to 17, do you look, does look very, very different. Um, there are also obviously other ways of checking the file has been updated, and I will mention one of those just towards the end. But just kind of running through conceptually how the risk assessment works, um, AC10, which hasn't really changed, so, so we've, we've, we've um, excluded that from the slide, still looking at risk overall. We're then looking at specific risks that impact the financial statements as a whole. Uh, that's at uh, AC11, and that, that's going concern, as we did before, and driven by 240, an updated fraud checklist. Um, that's the, the, the main element of that checklist, the AA11B. Uh, is a case view form. And then behind that, we've got some more detailed considerations of fraud. And we've retained that as a Word document because we we believe that some firms will want to complete that themselves. Some firms will actually want to send that to the client um, to complete for the auditor to review. So the actual detailed consideration we, we've retained in Word at AC11. Um, AC12 is our, our new consideration of controls. Um, in terms of the software, the, there's not a significant change to the functionality there. So I, I'm not going to go through AC12 in, in any detail today. But um, if you haven't already looked at those forms, I, I would strongly recommend having a good look at that before, well before you start planning audits, because the changes there are, are probably the most significant from a um, workflow perspective and from a what you need to get from the client perspective. Um, so definitely look at 12. Um, because you will need to sit down with a client and understand in maybe a bit more detail than you have historically um, what their control environment looks like, who is responsible for the, the risk surrounding IT, 
and also making sure you're talking to the right people at, at the client and it's, it's not simply the finance controller you are talking to head of it if that is necessary um we then look at materiality we then look at the individual area risk assessment or ser assertion uh risk assessment uh, and I'll, I'll look at that in a bit more detail in a moment too that feeds into the financial statement areas worksheet um the workflow there, I think, is now much better. Um, instead of having uh, a, the FSA AC10 at the start of the planning or start of the risk assessment stage, um, that's now really providing uh, the ROI with an executive summary of the risk levels. And that's completed after the rest of the um, uh, risk um, documentation. Um, AC16, we'll, we'll look at briefly, and that is um, a summary of our key and significant risks and then a time and plan down the bottom so that hopefully gives you a little bit of an understanding of, of what to expect uh, when you do open the template for the first time if you haven't already done so in terms of permanent section uh we've got as i said um in my introduction new pro forma documentation i'm not going to go through these in, in any great detail i've got a couple a couple of examples uh on the screen in front of us um the point i i i would highlight is uh, I deliberately said documentation. I didn't say checklists. Uh, yes, we're asking questions, but these are questions that need narrative responses. Um, some of them might be, yep, yeah, that's on the systems notes and it's a pure cross-reference. Others will require narrative documentation. So it's definitely not a yes, no um, answer. The biggest change in terms of functionality to the template is, however, AC14 and, and the FSA consideration of risk at a certain level and I'm going to jump into a case profile in, in just a moment and, and, and show you how this works but just before we get there the kind of conceptual change so the reason for the changes in the documentation is first of all the need to explicitly consider the magnitude and the likelihood of an error of a material error occurring so um, the the graphic in front of us is not embedded in the, in the um, methodology it's just an example it's illustrative but what we've got to be thinking, what we've got to be documenting on file is how likely is this error to occur? And if it does occur, what's the impact? How significant is this going to be on the financial savings? You could have something where the error is almost certain to occur, but actually is almost certain to be highly immaterial. And therefore, overall, it's going to be much lower down our, our risk spectrum. Uh, we've got to consider inherent risk factors, which I personally believe are, are actually helpful, and we'll see how that feeds into documentation. And we're going to consider risk on a spectrum after quite a lot of debates at HAT, really over the last 15 months, we have settled on four level uh, of, of inherent risk, uh, lower, moderate, higher, and then significant over the top. So um, the slide also mentioned that control risk, we, we need to look at separately, to be fair, I think the has documentation largely did that anyway, but I, I will just highlight that as we go through as well. So what we've got on screen in front of us is um, AC14 uh, ARA, the assertion of risk assessment. And um, just to, before we uh, look at the tangible fixed assets, if we just go up momentarily, one thing I would flag up is, is our, our technical team at HAT. We have realized we've identified that some of these questions are going to be different there is lots of guidance uh within the case for a template and there's lots of guidance um from hat separately so do have a look do select those drop downs and have a look at the guidance on this form we are looking at each individual area of the financial statements above performance materiality so if something's not material for example uh to intangible fixed assets uh you just deselect that and and, and the detail disappears and then what we're asking users to do is to consider each of the assertions to consider these new inherent risk factors, which I think structure and give guidance uh, to the, the assessment of inherent risk. That's obviously before the client's controls and before the auditor kicks in and a justification considering the factors and also the assertions. What you then need to do to evidence consideration of both the likelihood and magnitude is to consider, again, on, on a four level basis, how likely you think um, the error is to occur. And if it does occur, the magnitude. A lot of you may then think, well, well, surely the inherent risk should be automated as a result of that. We, we've chosen not to do that for, for, for good reason, I think, because it is a judgment call. You, you could have something where it is um, unlikely and high, but actually you, you do still feel that overall it's lower risk and the space there 
to add narrative. In terms of where you um, uh, fill in uh, the overall risk level, that's going to be the financial statements area worksheet, which now sits at AC15. And you've got the ability here, as before, to if all of your assertions are the same risk, to select that. I think valuation uh, on the previous form uh, did suggest that it could be a significant risk. Let's just go back and uh, yeah, probable and high, and therefore got the wrong one there. Um, probable and high, and therefore that would be a significant risk. Let me uh, just correct that. That's uh, the uh, problem of, of trying to talk and also. Um, put information into case where at the same time and now there we go so let me just um, correct that there we go that's all should should be fine now um, the control risk is preset as maximum that means we're we're not performing controls testing and then a new bit of functionality is instead of um, concluding and having to go through and, and enter the risk level on every single line you can now just select propose and what that's going to do is going to take a combination of the inherent risk and also our control risk and feed it through to um, then give you the overall risk of material misstatement. Uh, just maybe having a quick look at the drop down there. If you were going to test controls, if you're considering the operational effectiveness of controls and you change control risk to minimum, then you've got the ability to go, actually, that's going to be, um, our sales size will be reduced by including consideration of controls. So, that's how the risk um, levels feed in here um, and then we've got along here um, um, again um, as before consideration of whether we don't need sampling uh, whether we are going to be performing supportive analytical procedures or and uh, now uh, reducing our samples through these automated tools and techniques the one point we're taking out of there is consideration of whether you're doing control testing because that's actually being driven from our consideration of controls risk here so if control risk is maximum we're not going to do, be doing controls testing if you wanted to change that to a minimum then you would need to uh, evidence controls testing if successful our control risk remains as minimum and that's going to reduce our sample sizes um just jumping on to the sample size calculator um this is still in the field work section so i've just picked up a c2-1 which is our fixed asset sample size calculator uh, really no fundamental changes to this form uh, if I just go up to the top we've still got the population taken off key and large items which which we haven't done in this example um, and we're still considering our sample sizes on an assertion by assertion level a little bit of change to, to the documentation here just to or the phraseology on the form to link it very nicely back to um, the previous form what I want to highlight is the sample sizes are driven by the risk levels driven by um, the um, 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 risk factors that we've got there. Where it's a significant risk, what we're saying is nice and bright and red on the form here, is you've got to do something extra. So we've got still embedded in the methodology set sample sizes for lower, moderate and higher. Where it's a significant risk, you're going to have to do something extra, whether that is um, considering um, as extending sample size beyond the necessary size for high risk area or whether it's maybe different techniques that don't require sampling so that hopefully gives you an overview of um, the um, uh, main changes to planning in terms of risk and in terms of the FSA um, a couple other things to mention before I do hand back to Tom first of all is the risk function remember and I know a lot of you do utilize this uh, very well uh, the risk functions allows you to document significant risks, potentially other uh, important risks as well. And you can raise a risk by, on, on any case you form by clicking in the uh, white exclamation mark and then the big red circle at the top of the form. Uh, the risk function, the dialog box you'll see there on screen uh, is a little bit different. Um, it's been tweaked to align it to AC14 and the requirements of ISA 315. Uh, so we've brought in the how risk factors. Um, We've brought in the consideration of magnitude and likelihood of misstatement and also changed the phraseology regarding control risk. But it operates in exactly the same way as it did before um, for, for, from an IT perspective. A summary of those risks at the planning stage sits now at AC15, used to be AC14 risks. Uh, that's going to tell the RI what the key things that he or she uh, should be worrying about um, are. And obviously, I'm sure through the planning, they'll have their own uh, suggestions as well 
and clearly that needs to be linked to the audit program and specific testing um, documented and linked to on the audit program. And then AA7, the critical issues memo, is just another window into this risk database, obviously given the RVI at the finalization stage, an executive summary of how those key points have been resolved. Um, and those are, to be fair, the sort of major changes uh, of the template. Clearly, in the sort of time allowed this afternoon, got to, not got the ability to go through all of them line by line. There's a bit more detail in the release notes, and, and also there's a full um, summary of the changes within the template them itself as well. I um, just really want to flag up two final um, points. First of all, AC1, the optimizer checklist, just over on the left of the screen there. Uh, in the guidance document, we have now included just as a, a quick summary based on user feedback of what documents should be on the document manager at the planning stage. So if you have any concerns about the file being rolled forward correctly, maybe there, there's a form on there you think actually the update should have removed that. Maybe somebody has put it back um, just through um, um, habit. Uh, that's giving you a control there in terms of what should and shouldn't be on the planning stage. And then over the right-hand side of the screen, the AE document dealing with accounting estimates. Um, a bit more narrative here. So, so we, we, we're given consideration of are these areas material? Are you going to include a detailed program? And also to, to really allow firms to document very quickly why some estimates aren't even getting a risk assessment down the foot. We've got space to, to list out uh, any estimates and their value and, and the reason why, perhaps because it's below performance materiality, uh, why you're simply not even going to perform a risk assessment. And you're not needing to do that for every single tiny trivial um, estimate, but the feedback was people wanted the ability to document nice and quickly why something was not considered to be uh, to, to, to warrant a detailed risk assessment. So that gives you hopefully a snapshot of those content and functionality changes. I'm just going to pass back to Tom now, who's going to talk us through uh, the mechanics of actually um, updating, really signpost you uh, to some of the updating uh, guidance. Thanks, Andrew. And um, uh, if you if you have any uh, questions that you want to submit while I'm showing you the, the next segment, um, please use the Q&A option. Uh, we've got some questions that have come in, but um, you can continue to, to submit those uh, right up until we stop broadcasting. Um, but in the meantime, what I'm going to show you, as Andrew said, there is a uh, is just pointing in the right direction for an update guide that we have on our help site. You may or may not be aware uh, that that exists. So I'm just going to bring that up on my screen. Bear with me. Um, so hopefully you can see my screen there. It looks like you can. Uh, so we've got the help site here and we have this guide, uh, which is our audit advanced hat update guidance. We do have a getting started guide as well. That's in the process of being updated to reflect uh, the latest changes. Uh, but it does um, take you through the principle of how to prepare an, an audit file for hat. Um, this is our update guidance. So this is article 59 if you want to search by the article number. Um, but if you open up our, our guide that we created, um, then we've got a version 24 update guide, which will take you through lots of different considerations when you're updating your file. So we have lots of um, uh, queries uh, from clients about the best time to update your file, um, whether you should only update functionality, for example. Um, uh, uh, understandably, clients are concerned that work is going to be lost in the update process. So this guide really is designed to reassure you and take you through the best practices for different scenarios. So we have our uh, functionality and content updates guidance. So this gives you an overview of um, considerations for whether you would uh, apply functionality and or content updates. Um, it's also giving you guidance here on installing the new template. Of course, that might not be something that you um, take care of yourself. Um, but the contact at your firm um, uh, would hopefully find this useful in terms of the process for uh, First of all, getting the software updated, but also updating the individual files. And then we also have some considerations for different scenarios to do with smart sync. So if you're using smart sync, um, so for example, this first section is updating non smart sync files where the current year um, hasn't started. And then we have um, considerations for smart sync files in the same scenario. Um, and then we also have some frequently asked questions. I'm not I'm see breezing through this. I'm not going to take you through every section in detail. Um, but as I say, if you go to our help site, uh, then you'll see our uh, guide for um, updating 
hat version 24 of course that includes this one that we're looking at now i'm just going to bring up the slides and i'll signpost a couple more things for you but in the meantime certainly feel free to use the q a to log any additional questions that you have you should be seeing now our question slide just to show you where the q a option is uh, we do have um, some questions that have come in, so I'll bring Andrew back in and we'll just uh, cover a couple off there that um, I imagine are on uh, the minds of, of many of our uh, attendees today. So the first one is when does ISA 315 and 240 come into effect? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I mentioned it very briefly right at the start. I said December 22 years. So that's not strictly correct. It is um, uh, both standards um, actually come in periods commencing the 15th of December last year onwards. So um, clearly, um, and if, you know, if you're not quite had lunch yet, and then therefore your brain's not quite working, uh, that will generally be December 22 year ends. Uh, but do be very careful of short and long accounting periods. Okay, and the other uh, question we have here is, I've looked through the permanent documentation, and it seems that all the questions are covered in my existing systems notes. Do I have to complete the new forms as well? Uh, what I would say to that, um, Tom, is, is first of all, the, the, the firm in question, um, well done, because your systems notes are probably very, very good um, if all the new questions are covered by those notes. Um, in, in reality, the, the kind of control side and the system side, which I glossed over, um, is a codification and an expansion of best practice. So if your systems notes are good, a lot of the information, a lot of the questions we're asking will already be within uh, your working papers and there's no need to reinvent the wheel uh, i think you should work through the the new case review um, forms but it's probably a cross-referencing exercise what i suspect you'll find even if you feel your systems notes are pretty good on any particular client there will be a, a handful of areas where you think actually you know 315 has changed the uh, goalpost has moved the goalpost i should say and therefore i'm gonna have to go back to the client and get a little bit more information but yeah certainly um, I think some of those forms, you'll be entering information onto those forms. But if, if you've already got the information, just simply cross-reference it back to what you had before. Lovely. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I think we've got we've got a couple of minutes left, so we'll go through the wrap-up. Uh, any, any additional questions that you have, um, please continue to submit them, and we'll get back to you after the session. And I'm just going to jump to our next slide, uh, which is just reiterating how you can view uh, and sign up for our webinars as you have done for today so caseware.co.uk forward slash events you'll see all of our webinar listings there including the agendas and you can sign up to attend that also includes some other uh, event types um so any conferences that sort of thing usually pop up on there but certainly for our webinars uh, keep that page handy um, we will also notify you of upcoming webinars. So we've got a couple of quick plugs here. So we'll also notify you of our upcoming webinars on our LinkedIn page. So that's our uh, client services case for UK LinkedIn page and any other news within the business. So head over to there and uh, follow us on LinkedIn. We've also got our client services case where UK YouTube channel. So we have a webinar playlist. So our recording of today's session will be going on there very shortly. And um, if you subscribe and set your notifications, we'll, of course, let you know when new videos and webinars are added. And again, help site help.caseway.co.uk. That's for uh, all of your guidance that you can access without having to log in. Uh, the only need for logging in would be for things like downloads, which you can request access to if you don't have access to that sort of thing already. Uh, if you have any old knowledge base links, then it will direct you to the help site. Um, but if you need any additional help, you also have the option to chat live with our support team via the chat option, which pops up in the bottom right. So that's uh, where you can get all of, you, all of your resources. Um, certainly pop into the Q&A or into the survey afterwards if you have any additional questions or if you need uh, just to clarify where to get certain resources, where to get help if you need it. Uh, but that brings us to the end of today's session. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. We hope you enjoyed the webinar, found it useful. Take care, and we'll see you on the next session.